This is actually a deceptively simple parable. Jesus has to expressly define seven different objects in this parable for us to be able to grasp the main meaning of this text so that we don't end up with the wrong interpretation. He has to define what the sower is, the field, the good seed, the weeds, the enemy, the harvest, and the reapers. For a simple story, that's a lot of moving parts. (laughs) But so let us aim this morning to grasp what the main picture, what the main thing Jesus desires us to hear in this parable, and then we'll examine it to see how it applies to our lives today. I hope for your sake that in your Bibles that the parable spoken and the parable explained are on the same page, because we're going to be doing a lot of back and forth this morning. So beginning in verse 24, as we examine this under the microscope, it says he put another parable before them saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now, verse 37 says this sower is the son of man, that this is Jesus using one of his favorite terms that he would use for himself, the son of man, as taken from Daniel chapter 7. That's worth looking into in your own time. The field is defined in verse 38 as the world. Now, if if you've been a Christian for a long time, hearing various pastors speak on this parable, you might have heard somebody say that the field is the church. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says the field is the world. If, If Jesus had intended this to be about his church specifically, there's a word he could have used that means church, but he didn't use it. He's referring here to the world as in, the whole world. So keep that in mind as we unpack that in a little while. The good seed, he says, and the corresponding wheat that came from it, uh, Jesus says in verse 38, are the sons of the kingdom. These are those who would believe the gospel and so be saved. The good news of what Jesus has done for us. And by the way, sons of the kingdom is a awesome little devotional reminder that we are not just guests in God's house. We are not just guests in God's kingdom, but here it says sons, and by application, daughters as well. We are adopted family members of the kingdom of God, not just invited guests. We are part of the family of God's kingdom. Now, this simple illustration is complicated in verse 25 by the enemy. As it says, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. (laughs) Regretfully, this is not an entirely made up parable. This was apparently common enough of something to do to your enemy that the Romans had laws against doing this. So Jesus isn't making up a facetious illustration. This actually happened. Some translations, you know, depending your translation, it might say weeds or it might say tares. Uh, I grew up on tares, so I'm going to be saying it back and forth. It's talking about the same thing. It's referring to a, a particular type of weed that existed in Israel in the first century. And this was a particularly deceptive weed because it looked exactly like wheat, right up until the harvest time. And the only time you could notice the difference was right at harvest time when the wheat would grow grain at the end and the weeds did not. It's the only difference, noticeably. And this highlights a point that we were examining in the last parable, the parable of the sower, that what separates a believer from a not yet believer is fruit. Or in this case, grain. It's the same analogy. It's what it produces. 
you know, that determines or showcases who you are. That if you are a believer, you can't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you and be changed from darkness to light and that not change your life. At some point, you're going to see the fruits of the Spirit showing up in your life that we read about in Galatians 5.22. We see the fruit of love manifest in our lives, love for others, love for God, love to serve others in his name as Jesus did. That will eventually come. And as we examined last week, it's not about, you know, the quantity of your good works that matters. It's what you are that matters. It's your God-given identity as a son or daughter of God that makes the difference. The point of the last parable, the parable of the sowers, we saw that there was the fruit that yielded 30, 60, or 100 times over. It didn't matter how much you yielded. It didn't matter how much fruit was produced. The point was that you were of the type that did produce. It mattered what you are, in other words. <laughs> the, to put it another way, the weeds in this parable would not turn into wheat if they tried harder. They're physically incapable of doing that. It's not what they are. It's a completely different species from wheat. There's nothing in their DNA that would make them produce grain. And, and so this completely different species, these weeds, these tares, these not yet believers are sown by the evil one, the devil. And by the way, I will use that term, you know, not yet believers a lot. I, I don't like the term non-believers. That has a negative gospel connotation to it. I like that word yet. I'll talk more about that in a bit. But either way, these are people who have not responded to the gospel because that's what the enemy of our souls does. He works to hinder the response to the gospel and what is sown in people's hearts. No, that, that's his goal, to hinder the furtherance of the gospel. And this picture should bring to mind, for those of us who are aware of the scriptures, scriptures like John 8, 44, where Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. Or 1 John five nineteen that beautifully says, we know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. This is a very binary passage of scripture. You're either a weed or a wheat. You're either a a son or daughter of God or under the power of the evil one. There's no middle room in this parable. And so with that in mind, with this binary, this either or separation, It's reflected in how the owner responds to this attack. His servants give one option of how to respond to it in verse 28. That says, he said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then what do you, uh, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So again, making sure we have the big picture here with all of these moving parts. The, The harvest depicted here tells us in verse 39 that this refers to the end of the age. This is the day that is appointed when all accounts will be settled. When the final separations are made, when the grain is gathered into the barn, but the wheat is burned. When Jesus says to those on his right hand, the sheep on his right hand, you know, enter into my rest, enter into eternal life, but the goats on his left, into eternal punishment. This is that day with angels serving as reapers of the process. And again, two destinations, the furnace and the kingdom. So looking at that big picture again for a minute before we really dive into the details, the main point of this parable that everything else revolves around is this, that there are two types of people in our world today. 
the precious sons of the kingdom and those who are under the sway of the evil one. And they will continue to grow alongside one another, often indistinguishable from one another from looking on outward appearance. Until that last day, when the judge who judges righteously will make this final separation, separating the wheat from the tares, sons of the kingdom to everlasting life, shining like the sun in their father's presence, and not so good news for those who are not. The place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the good news, while not explicitly said in this passage, but very much implied from the overall narrative of Scripture, is that there is still good news in here, that, that anyone can change their identity from a weed into a wheat. It's not said so here because that's not the main point of this parable, but my goodness, it is absolutely true. The gospel, what G, the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for you is po- so powerful, it could fundamentally change who you are, change your spiritual identity the same way that as miraculous as it would be to change wheat or weeds into wheat. So that same power can transform us sinners into righteous saints before God. Not based on how much work we do or how hard we try to grow grain (laughs) or produce good works or whatever. But because God has changed us from the inside out according to his love and grace and mercy. So that all this morning who repent of their sin and believe in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross will be saved. That's good news this morning. And that is what Jesus offers to each of us. So if you don't hear anything else from me this morning, hear that. But with that in mind, what are we to make of this parable? What implications of this do we have for us today? Well, for one, this parable answers the question of why there is so much evil in this world and why it seems like so few people respond to the gospel because Satan threw weeds all over the place because the field, the world is full of weeds, sons of the evil one. That explains why there's so much wickedness in this world today. And it began with sowing those weeds back in Genesis chapter 3, but that's another story. That explains why there's so much evil in the world. But interestingly enough, this parable, by implication, gives us a satisfactory answer to that so-called problem of evil that you guys might have heard of. Now, you've heard this argument before, and it's troubled many people. It goes, if God is all good and all powerful, he would destroy evil. Evil is not destroyed. Therefore, an all-good and all-powerful God cannot exist. You guys have heard some version of that before. And if I had a nickel for every time I heard some version of that, I, I could retire. And it's a persuasive argument. But the argument is refuted with one word. You put one tiny word into that argument, the whole thing falls apart. And I'm going to give you guys the answer. Some of you guys need a pen for this. The word that destroys that argument is yet. You throw the word yet into there, the whole thing falls apart. God has not yet destroyed evil. Now the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises, speaking logically. (laughs) God has not yet destroyed evil, therefore there is no God? No, that doesn't follow. No, God will destroy all evil and end all suffering one day. It just hasn't come yet. And Jesus gives the reason why he is waiting in this parable, this all-important parable. Because he says in this parable that the weeds and the weeds are intertwined with one another throughout the field, the world. And it, it was asked, you know, why doesn't the landowner do something? Why don't we just start the harvest already and rip up everything? Well, Jesus says, not a chance. The harvest must not come until the appointed time. Otherwise, he will destroy the precious wheat alongside of that. 
alongside those weeds, which is of great value to this landowner, this sower in this parable. Because, guys, once the harvest comes, that's it. The field is empty after the harvest, and so will be the world at the end of the age. So, and that being said, there will be no more new wheat after the harvest or believers to be gathered. Jesus is purposely delaying his coming and the final judgment for the sake of those who are still yet to respond to the gospel. That's why Jesus is delaying his coming for the sake of those who will respond and why evil is allowed to persist for a time. And I, for one, am glad of that Jesus is waiting because that means more and more people are given a chance to respond to this good news. You know, I've listened to a lot of old tapes and old sermons, and apparently the hot thing back in the 1980s was saying Jesus was coming back in the 1980s. A lot of false teachers even put dates back in the 80s of when Jesus had to come back by. I'm glad that they were wrong, frankly. <laughs> because, I mean, how many of you people, you know, if Jesus came back in the 80s, wouldn't be here, wouldn't be on the right side of the harvest if Jesus came back back then? I mean, I wouldn't even be here. I was born in the 80s. That would have been a problem. <laughs> or how many of you guys, even if Jesus came back 10, 20 years ago, how many of you guys wouldn't be on the right side of the harvest? What about your loved ones? Friends, family members, the people we got to minister to at the outreaches, would they be on the right side of the harvest? No. So I, for one, am glad he delayed his coming because every day more and more people are reached with this good news of the gospel. And so as bad as the, these weeds are and as a mess of the world, the world continues to become. Jesus knows his harvest is not yet complete. And I don't believe he's going to, he's willing to even let one perish without him. So this ought to give us an inclination of how much God loves us to, and how precious this wheat is to him. If it means he's delaying the harvest and letting these weeds take over the field Seemingly for a time. But there's one final major application we have to really look at in this parable before we finish. And that is the reaction of the servants in the parable. So, returning to verse 28, upon discovering the weeds of the servants, uh, the servants' first reaction is, you know, do you want us to go out and gather them? In other words, do you want us to pluck out all of this weed and be done with it? And, you know, that's the solution of so many people. Let's just destroy the enemy already. God, why are you being so patient with all of this? Let's get Armageddon going and be done with it. That's the gut reaction of so many. And it's been that way for years. Look at James and John who earned the nickname Sons of Thunder. They got that back in Luke chapter 9 when they were asking Jesus, Hey, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven upon these unbelieving Samaritans? Jesus had to explain to them, No, that's not it at all. That's not God's heart. You see this in the book of Jonah when Jonah had wanted to see the great city of Nineveh burned down like Sodom and Gomorrah under God's judgment. But the Lord said to him, Should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which there is more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. Jonah could only see the wickedness of their past. He was completely unaware of the revival that was taking place. People changing from darkness to light. People responding in faith to the good news that was presented to them and the repentance that was taking place in their hearts. He couldn't see it because he was just sulking, waiting for judgment. Oh, that better not be us, church. That better not be us. Because look, it, it's easy to throw up our hands in the air and get excited about judgment. And like, all right, let's get with the end of the age already. It's time. But if that's our mentality, we might miss 
the grace that God just might be preparing to show this next generation. I don't pray for a judgment. I pray for revival in this nation. I pray for turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children. I pray for a returning of not just this nation, but those who call themselves Christians to return with all of their hearts to God and to see what God just might do with that. God's mercy always triumphs over judgment. So getting to my point, what what did Jesus say to these servants? He essentially says, now is not the time for judgment. Now is the time for mercy. Now is the time for mercy to be shown even to the wicked. Because the church is not called to be the ones in this passage to separate the wheat from the tares. To say, this one is wheat, this one is a weed, this person's a Christian, this person is not. That's not what the church is called to do because, frankly, one of the things we can tell from this parable clearly is we can't tell the difference most of the time. We can't tell with certainty. And so we ought not to be in a place of judgment if we can't do it with certainty. And look, I, I've, God's definitely softened my heart in this area. If you can articulate the gospel to me and not miss anything important in it, and you say you believe it and you're walking in it, that's good enough for me. I'm not here to be a weed inspector. That's not what God has called me to be. Because when the church has become the arbiter of who's in and who's out, when it's the church that's making pronouncements like that, things get ugly real quick. That's how you end up with, like, the Inquisition. That's how you end up with legalism. Pastors saying, well, if I don't see enough fruit in your life, you're not a Christian. That's, that, that's how you end up there when you put the church in the place that Jesus is supposed to be. Look, the only time I can say with certainty if a person is in or out is whether they say it themselves. You know, if, if they can't articulate what the gospel is, if they don't know it or they say that they don't believe it. Otherwise, I must leave that job for Jesus and his angels at the end of the age. And why do we do that? Because that wheat is precious to God. And calling someone who is a Christian, a son of Satan, just because their sin might look different than mine, or because their sanctification isn't happening as fast as I'd expect it to, that's just wrong. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that church discipline shouldn't exist. That absolutely needs to happen as well. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5 that he threw somebody out of the Corinthian church for continuously being involved in an utterly grotesque sin. And he threw them out of the church until, and broke all fellowship with that person until they repented, until they were restored. That, and, but that's not separating the wheat from the tares. That is calling someone to be what God has called them to be. And calling on a person to repent of what God has said to repent of. That's biblical. 1 Corinthians uh, 13 says that when we were children, we, we, we did childish things. We spoke as a child. We acted like a child. But when we grew up, when we became mature, we put away childish things. That's what we're all, in one sense, called to do, to grow up, to mature as Christians. As Christians, we're called to repent of our sins, to turn from the things that separate us from God, and to run towards the things that please Him. That's our calling. So my first reaction when I see somebody struggling with sin, or somebody not coming to church, somebody disappearing from the ranks for a while... My first reaction isn't, oh, that person, I guess they weren't a Christian. I I just want to reach out and say, you are called to be more than this. What's happened to you or the way that you're acting is telling me something's wrong spiritually. What's going on? Let's talk about it. Let's see, how can we help? 
Because let me tell you, the most loving thing you can do is let somebody know something is wrong if they don't see it. That's something I think the church really needs to, re- to relearn, frankly. To be reminded that it is unloving to let somebody have a false assurance that everything is okay when it's not okay. To let somebody be comfortable in sin is unloving. You know, it's, it's a myth that Jesus went to the sinners and didn't call them to repent. Yes, he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, and he hung out with the outcasts of society, but he didn't just affirm everything that they were about. Every time you see Jesus speaking with these people, he's calling them to repent. Even the woman caught in adultery. Yes, he showed her great mercy, but he also said, go and sin no more. We forget that part of the gospel. We forget the calling to holiness and repentance, both when telling others and in our own lives. That God has called us to forsake those former ways of darkness and to pursue the light. So whether these people are weeds or wheats in this parable, you know, it might not be possible for me to discern who somebody is, what side you're on, where in this binary you fall. But God's will for each of us is to call upon his name. Whether we're a sinner who is unrepentant and needs to be saved for the first time, or whether we're Christians who are stumbling and and having difficulties in our faith, we're all called to call upon his name, to draw close to him, to renounce those former ways, to renounce the old man of sin within us, and to pursue God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's an encouragement we can give blanketly to everyone that we know and meet. So this week, let us understand from this parable why there's so much evil and wickedness in this world. Let us take comfort on that same end, that there's a day coming when evil itself will be judged. It is not always going to be like this. In the meantime, let us make efforts to add to the harvest while telling everyone what that good news is that saved a wretch like me and gave me a second chance I did not deserve. While at the same time also recognizing what our job is and what our job isn't. Thanks be to God. Amen.